Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the latest edition of the Army Talk Fast Five. It is April 24th, 2020, and we are coming to you again live with the crew. We've got Ann Mazinga. Hey. Carter Jensen. Hey, guys. And, of course, Emma, the intern from Jersey. Hi, everyone. <laughs> hey, how's it going? All right, man, we were just saying, this week, for me, I don't know about you guys, but this week has been so fast. Like, it's Groundhog Day, but, man, things are just moving, moving, and moving at such a fast pace. How have you guys been? And what's been uh, what's been something that uh, struck your fancy this week? That struck my fancy? Struck I your don't... fancy. I just love that expression. My, my going list when of things whistle. Chris says, yeah. <laughs> oh, God, I definitely don't like that one. Uh uh what uh what struck my fancy i don't know it's been so nice here so i think everybody's mood yeah my mood has dramatically improved since last week when i think i was like the most depressing person alive on this podcast but yeah it's great sun is shining it's beautiful it's gonna be a beautiful weekend in minneapolis it's great carter you were you were going all out on the takeout this week right like that was kind of i did another round of takeout if you guys remember from last week uh it did not hold us back we still are doing our one takeout a week uh both for our sanity and to support the neighborhood is that what it is um, one takeout a week that's just kind of our thing you know okay. both for you know both for the budget and for you know to make sure that you know we're supporting the local neighborhood and treating ourselves sometimes so uh yeah we did a uh, takeout from a local pizza spot and unlike my last experience i found this to actually be a really incredible thing and again there's no real technology involved a big number plastered to the side of the wall you call them, you give them their last name, and the dance to ensure you got your pizza safe, warm, clean, fast was was really amazing, and, and I loved it. The problem was I decided to drive my moped there, uh, and so, so really the entire you, science behind it was thrown out the window. But I, I can respect that. That was my error as a consumer. Right. Millenn- millennial Darwinism, we'll call yeah. it that. And freaked me out on the takeout thing. So like, and I don't know if we can get, we might be able to get this picture. If you send me this picture, I might be able to get it as my background here. But, and, and like sends me this text yesterday at like 12 o'clock and it's her in a car with a gloves and masks with the gloves on and mask. And she's in front of my house and she just sends me the text. Right. I'm at your front door. And I'm like, what the, what the hell? I just got out of the shower too, mind you. And I'm like, what are you doing? What? And she, she wasn't there anymore. And I'm like, I'm texting, I'm trying to figure it out. And she's like, I brought you coffee. And this yeah. was, mind you, this is my nice first, you, Anne. it was very nice of her, but this is my first exposure to the outside world of takeout and del- of takeout like that, because we have not done it in the Omnitalk household. We've had groceries delivered and things like that, but we have the whole detox program going, but we basically had shut-ins for like seven weeks. And so I had to go through this whole thing about, you know, mentally, okay, am I going to drink this coffee? Did Anne really wear the gloves? Did she really wear the mask the whole time? Or was that oh my God, I sent you photographic evidence for that reason so that <laughs> you would make sure that you knew. I even sent wet wipes. I took wet wipes with you knowing that you likely would just completely dump out all the coffee. But you know what? It's a thought that counts. I wanted to support our local business, a coffee shop that is doing a really good job of takeout. So yes, I brought you coffee knowing full well it could be poured directly down the drain but yeah yeah i don't know with with all these things going on with deep fakes i'm not sure how much i buy that picture but but emma what's what's the latest out of out of god what is you know just a tough area in the world right now which is new york new jersey uh how are things there what's the what's 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 the mood of the room out there so to speak well it's pretty much the same i mean our weather went from being really nice to kind of being really terrible so that's been unfortunate but it's just kind of the same old, getting used to everything. Are people starting to take like, a, is there like a deeper breath that's coming from people? Like I know like the number of cases have started to kind of go down or the number of new cases have started to go down. Are people feeling a little less or a little more relieved in a sense? Or is it, you know, still pretty heightened uh, comparatively to where it was say two or three weeks ago? I would say people are a little bit less concerned and, you know, the like anxiety has decreased a little bit. But still, I think people are really prepared to be in this for a very long time. Very long time. So they're still thinking there's a there's a really long road ahead. Got it. Makes sense. Makes sense. All right. Well, we have an, what I think is going to be an awesome show today because there are a lot of hot topics that um, some of which have to do with coronavirus, but many that actually don't, that are just very impactful 
for the future of retail. So to give you a little bit of a tease, we're going to talk 7-Eleven. We're going to talk Anne's favorite retailer, Kroger, and Emma might even bring up the Krogi. What is it? The Krogis? Yeah, that's what it is. Uh, we've got Google making the news, Facebook as well. Again, Google, Facebook leading the news in retail. And then a fun, fun story at the end around high vs So stick around for that one. First, got to give a thanks to our sponsor. And our sponsor this week is Trigo. So Trigo is developing the most advanced AI and computer vision based checkout free system for the grocery industry. Using standard cameras and proprietary algorithms, Trigo converts real size stores, introducing a frictionless shopping experience. Together with Tesco, Trigo is currently piloting the world's largest checkout free store. To learn more about Trigo, you can visit www.trigo.tech. And cool, fun housekeeping note, actually Trigo CEO, Michael Gabay will actually be on stage at Virtual Shop Talk next week. So you can check him out, hear more about Trigo. Believe it or not, yours truly is also anchoring Shop Talk next week. So I am the finale presenter with Melissa Gonzalez of the Lioness Group next week. Uh, right now, there's about 6,000 people set to attend the conference, so we're getting ready for that one. Melissa and I are kind of putting our topics that we plan to cover together as we speak. So hopefully, everyone listening will uh, register for Virtual Shop Talk. It's next Thursday. Um, all right. Well, I want to get to the headlines, but the other quick shout out I want to give is there was a huge announcement in the world of Walmart this week. So Walmart has a new CMO, and that is William White, who is formerly of Target. He was formerly a senior vice president at Target. I just want to say shout out to William. I've known him for a really long time. He's a good friend of mine, a friend on Facebook. Uh, he's a really good dude. Uh, this is a great hire for Walmart. Kudos to them uh, for poaching this talent. William is one of the smartest guys I know, but the other thing too is he's incredibly well-liked. And I think when you look at how well somebody can function and succeed at a company like Walmart that is so big, uh, and just presents so many challenges. That is a huge, huge asset to have. So I think for all of us here at Army Talk, wish him the absolute best. Because, uh, hey, like we've said before, America needs Walmart now, and they need Walmart to do really well. And we've been very inspired what they've been doing as uh, in terms of what they've been doing as of late. All right. With all that out of the way, Anne, you're in a better mood. It. You said it. <laughs> I mean, start it out. Mood. And that is debatable, but let's start it out. Oh, my gosh. All right. Uh, this week, 7-Eleven opened its first ever hospital pop-up store at Children's Medical Center in Dallas. So people working in the hospital can pick up grocery and personal care products, phone chargers, fresh food options, including salads, heat meat, uh, take and heat pizza, wings, you name it. Uh, and to enhance the safety of the shopping experience, the pop-up store will also allow the hospital staff to use their employee badges to pay for merchandise. You can also use the traditional methods of, you know, the credit debit card checkout, and they've got the sneeze guards and everything up. Um, but they also have announced that within the next couple of weeks, they're also going to add their frictionless and contactless mobile checkout feature at this location. So uh, the customers will be able to shortly scan and pay for their purchases um, on the the 7-Eleven app uh, or mobile devices, which I think this is a huge announcement. You look at what they were able to get up and running in two weeks in a place that, I mean, who is more deserving than frontline workers in a children's hospital um, and just what they've been able to accomplish, get set up, even though they aren't rolling it out with the full contactless payment like they probably wanted to in this initial concept. They've done quite a ton this in, in such a short amount of time to just get the concept out in front of people, testing, learning and what i think is even bigger here is what this might mean for the future of what a 7-eleven store looks like after covid they're doing this as a test to learn more but what does this mean for future footprints of 7-eleven um i think I, i'll put that question out there to you guys and curious what your thoughts are on on this pop-up yeah carter why don't you take this one first I would say just walk out just in time, right? To steal something from Amazon. We've been talking about the evolution and the innovation that's been coming from 7-Eleven now for the last, what, four, five, six months. And now what's crazy is that they're actually taking it into the epicenter of a place that needs it most. So it's not necessarily, obviously it's clear that these frontline workers need the support from a, a C-store standpoint and all the things that they can offer. You talk about food, groceries, you know, basic needs, all that kind of stuff. But then you combine it with the technology and the innovation that they have been working on 
now for four, five, six months. And not only do you have a convenient solution, you have a solution that maintains uh, the, the safety standards and the safety kind of the critical infrastructure that these people are going to need to rely on in order to keep this store safe in the new environment that they're about to go in on. So I think it's, I think it's amazing. I thought the other thing that came to mind for me was just how easy it is to replicate these things around around need areas, right? You know, so you look at a smaller footprint providing um, things like hot food, even like they've been doing this across multiple countries around the world for forever. And so now all of a sudden they're saying, well, actually it's not that hard to pop up an entire uh, ecosystem right in the middle of a hospital. And I, I think you'll expect to see this uh, in other, other locations as well in the coming weeks and months. Yeah. Emma, what's Emma, the intern, what's uh, what you, you know, you, you kind of take up the, 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 the youngest member of, of the Omnitalk crew here. What, what, what's the take generally on, what's your take on the story? And then what's your take on 7-Eleven in general? I've never been to a 7-Eleven. I don't even, I don't even know where one is, but okay. like there's none here. I've never seen one in Minnesota. I've, I don't know, but I did volunteer at a hospital in high school. And I think that having a pop-up convenience store is like amazing because usually hospital cafeterias, they are depressing and sad places. And to have something reliable and probably about as safe as possible, I think that that's going to be really, really great for hospitals going forward. Yeah. Inter oh, interesting. Okay. Interesting. So this is, so it was not on the Gen Z Richter scale before. Now it is. The other thing I'd say about this story that I would add is, I don't, and I'm curious what you guys think on this too, is I don't think this actually, this story really has that much to do with COVID. I mean, I think it has to do with COVID in the sense of like, it's happening right now, it's contemporary. But really when you look at what we've talked about with Amazon Go and where Amazon Go has tried to take that strategy and what 7-Eleven has tried to do alongside of Amazon Go's efforts, this makes a ton of sense. Like what was the last thing we heard? And we've almost kind of forgotten about it because it happened right before all this started, but Amazon Go was licensing their tech to airports, right? It's the same type of thing. So when I start to think about, okay, people are using their badges to pay. Well, where are all the other places we can have these type of micro experiences? Hospitals, like Emma just said, and you guys have said is one. Airports, airport employees, all kinds of things in, in terms of that could happen as well. Office buildings, gyms, there's all kinds of things where this type of understanding and infrastructure, if you learn how it works, could start to be used and deployed you know, throughout the world, really, that's the, the crazy thing about this. So what it tells me again, is that Amazon and 7-Eleven are so far in front of their brethren on these types of concepts relative to anyone else. Because quite frankly, where else have you heard about any experiment, experimentation on this type of scale and trying to attack this, trying to attack and attract this type of customer? Yeah, and the, just the general flexibility of the concept right now. Two weeks. This pop-up got put up in two weeks. And I think outside of like the physical structures that you're talking about, Chris, like office buildings, airports, those kinds of things, you start to look at what they might be able to do at, say, Coachella. Now that they can put up mm. a store and you've got wristbands already paying for things as you go throughout the experience, like this is positioning them to start testing other things, food festivals, like all these other kinds of things that are of a much more temporary nature than a, a more permanent setting in one of those spaces, I think. That's an, that's an odd, that is an amazing point. Yeah, I mean, thought about the, the festival side of things. I mean, I guess, you know, from my perspective, when you're willing to do this, if you're watching at home, and that's how I'm getting my groceries now with Anne in a mask, you know, anything is possible. So, so let's hit the, let's hit the next story here. Uh, who's got it? Emma, why don't you take us to story number two, headline number two. Yes, Kroger has created a coronavirus crisis guide, which is a grand blueprint for retailers, restaurants, and other sectors as they work towards reopening. Kroger's blueprint for businesses includes actionable recommendations and learnings that the company has applied in the last six weeks to safeguard associates, customers, and communities. So, I love Kroger. I don't even know if I've ever been to a Kroger either, but I'm just obsessed with them. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I've and, ever been to one. That's so awesome. Well, the so authored by the Krogies. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> the, this report was lacking a lot of the Krogies, Emma, I have to say. They, they didn't go full force on that. They could have, yes. So, so here's the thing yeah, about this one. Yeah, they definitely left that out. <laughs> 
here's the thing about this one. So here in Minnesota, actually yesterday, um, it was announced that we started or starting to look at businesses reopening with a lot of stipulations, right? Um, they have to fill out forms, they have to put plans in place, et cetera. And I think you're going to see this need grow for businesses, retailers, looking for information on how do we best safeguard our employees, our shoppers, and our, uh, and our community. And not only is it going to be the right thing to do, the thing that you should be doing, it's going to be mandated by law. And I think that if anyone can publish a source of reliable information, it's a retailer like Kroger who's gone through it and is who probably has unfortunately learned from their mistakes over the last six weeks. And I'm fascinated to see what this actually looks like. Now, like I said, I haven't seen it, so I can't necessarily put all of my weight to say this is a beautiful document that's going to solve everyone's world. Um, but Emma, you might have, right? I did. I went to KrogerBlueprint.com, which is where it is. Ooh. They also have it in their like mm. Instagram bio. And it's about a 17 page just PDF. It's super simple. It's written so that anyone can understand it. But they have links in there that direct you um, right to like a Google Drive where you can get all of these downloads of signage. They even have free little audio bits that you can play in your over your like sound system. And it's amazing. I mean, it's not That's the prettiest genius. thing that ever lived, but the information is there. And it even has like questions for managers to like challenge them to see how they're doing and how they can make their stores as safe as possible. And you read it too. Like, well, you had some big take. You thought, you thought it was pretty interesting. I remember you read it in pretty great detail too. And, and we were talking about it yesterday. Yeah, I think there's been a wave of thoughts about this approach. The first headline, it's like, nice PR move, Kroger. This is a brilliant right. move of you extending the olive branch, not just to the rest of the grocery industry, but really, as Carter was kind of mentioning, you know, this is, this is a blueprint. Grocery's kind of leading the way because they've been so impacted by the virus for how the rest of the of retail and businesses in general um spaces in general will have to function once they start opening back up so i think this is a helpful guide the other thing that i think is important to mention in this is that kroger is also you know internationally recognized so their their scope really goes beyond just the united states and so i think when you start to look at putting something like this out there for mom and pop bodegas, whether they're in Germany or Italy or, you know, the UK, to be able to have this as even just a, a resource to start um, off of is, is really helpful. And I, I commend them for the kind of like hustler startup nature. Like they put a WordPress page together that's hosting this thing. So they didn't go through all of the corporate like ladders to get this out. They, you can tell that they really put a, an effort forward to get this information out there. Um, everything from Chris and I, you were talking about, like they have information on contactless payments or even yeah. suggesting, you know, the last note I, I'll say on this one is even suggesting technologies in here that you mm -hmm. might start to explore mm -hmm. as a grocer, regardless of size, I think is really is really um, commendable and will, I think, move the industry forward, especially for people that had no idea that things like contactless payments could be implemented in a rolled out phased approach that are, are accessible to a small regional grocer all the way up through a Kroger size grocer. No, I think I I think it's really hard to find fault with this. Like I really do. I I went through that range of emotions like you did too. Reading this when I first saw it. first when I first read it, I was like, wait, what is really here? And I couldn't find anything. But then I talked to you a little bit more about it yesterday, and started digesting it a little bit more. Yeah, it's hard to find fault. I mean, the big thing is, will this thing live? Like that, it's not just a point in time PR thing. That's the question for me. Like, will it live on and get updated? And Will it reinform the population here across, you know, the U.S. and anywhere else, you know, as we go along? Because, yeah, I mean, people need how-tos. Like, especially if you're busy and you're small, you're running a mom-and-pop shop, you don't have a lot of resources, you don't have time to do the research in the middle of all this stuff. So being able to look at something that says, hey, have you thought about all this? We've all been at that point in our life trying to do something. And anytime we can find those things, it's a godsend. I mean, heck, we're trying to, we're going through that right now, trying to set up a referral program for OmniTalk, which, by the way, fans, is coming soon uh with lots of cool prizes but like having a how-to guide on how to do that it's the same damn thing as you know trying to understand how do you operate under this type of situation and lots of people are experimenting with different stuff even to carter's example in the beginning ordering pizza all right let's do story number three i think i've got this one and story number three this one is big folks and there's a lot of dynamics to this but this is about google so google makes product listings free on its shopping service as it takes on Amazon. So according to AdAge, Google will now allow brands to post product listings on its shopping service for free starting next week 
as it tries to become more competitive with Amazon. Previously, the search giant required brands to pay for the listings per click. The move was announced last Tuesday. Now, it doesn't mean that there won't be paid ads in the service. They'll still Google will still charge for ads that appear above and below the listings. And, and brands can also still buy product ads that appear on Google's main search page. But this shows you that in this time when all this is happening, that Google is still trying to go after the online shopping and marketplace business in relation to Amazon. So let's throw it out there. Who wants to go first? We've talked a lot about Google, right, in the last year, but probably not enough. And I think every time mm -hmm. times we bring it up, and I say not enough, it's not on us. I think it's on Google. We have consistently given them a little bit of trouble saying, you know, they're not innovating enough within the commerce space. You know, they're losing, remember that first search stat that we constantly brought up over the last year of like 60%, 70% of first product searches are happening on Amazon itself right. rather than on Google. And we really think that ultimately Google should be making more of a headway into, uh, into this world. And I think they should be. Now, I think this olive branch or this innovation or this discount or however, however you want to call it, um, I think is them taking advantage of the time that we're in currently, taking advantage of the time when people are looking to to figure out ways or merchants are looking to figure out ways to get their product in front of customers and new and different uh, through new and different strategies. And I think uh, Google making it free is just eliminating another barrier, try to get more merchants onto that platform as quickly as they can. And they're going to make money over time through the ads and, you know, through just more involvement within their platform. So I, I think it's a smart move. I think I've seen a lot of press about it over the last week and yeah. I'll be curious to see how much this actually moves the needle. Yeah. And what do you think? Yeah, actually Carter hit on almost every single point that I had, I had listed one, I think I was actually surprised Carter um, to find out that now it's at two thirds of customers are, are who search for, for products um, on Amazon. They're going to Amazon first. That was much higher than I had realized, I guess. I thought it was closer to half or a little bit over half, but, um, but yeah, I mean, you look at the conversion rate, like if you're comparing this to uh, Amazon sponsored products, which is essentially the same product just on Amazon um, as Google's shopping ads, the conversion from the Amazon products is 100%, 100%. And so if you look at Google shopping ads right now, the conversion rate of buying those products is only 20%. So I think that, you know, Wait, say like, that again, Ann, so everyone, I want to make sure I understand that too. And so, sure everyone else hears that. so Amazon right now has something called sponsored products that they would publish once you search for a product. Mm -hmm. And then Google shopping ads right now that are the same equivalent. So if you sh search for sh something on Google shopping mm -hmm. ads, these are the things that pull up as mm -hmm. like the recommended products. Mm -hmm. So the conversion rate on the Amazon sponsored products. So when I search water bottles on Amazon, I get my thing, the, the Amazon sponsored product conversion rate is a hundred percent. Google shopping ads conversion rate right now is only 20%. <laughs> so I think that with Google removing that friction point of, you know, like Carter said, just get your product on there. We get to test things. I think they're, they're losing the pay per click uh, money that they're getting from each of those uh, those merchants. However, I think this gives them a lot more runway as they start to expand that uh, Google Shopping ad platform, and then they can start to collect more money from the uh, the paid Google Shopping ads that they could potentially get down the road from this. So, so you guys are you guys are you guys are pretty bullish on this, then you two are you and Carter. So it sounds I'm, like you are, Ann. I would say I'm bullish on this being an appropriate test. Do I think it's actually going to, you know, make that much of a dent in how people are searching for products and whether they go to Google now versus Amazon? I don't know, but I think yeah. it's it's the right time and place for it. It's a good like time this. to do it. I guess you're saying yeah. the timing is right. Like we've said with a lot of things, 7-Eleven and everybody else, like now's the time to experiment. Carter? Let's let's look at it like a, a supply and demand standpoint, right? We use this a lot when we're analyzing businesses like Uber or whatever that might mm -hmm. be. Well, the supply, you know, the supply needs to be robust and vast, especially in a shopping world and diverse and, and all that in order to drive the demand, right? So if you were to go and let's say, which right now, I don't believe this is going to immediately change my behavior as a consumer. Let's say though, that I did want to go buy some new headphones and I did show, choose to go to Google. Uh, if I did that and I actually had a good shopping experience because I had, you know, the suppliers I wanted, a good diversity, yeah. price, et cetera. Well then, you know, I might actually continue to do that. But I would argue that right now, Google is focused on this promotion 
simply on the supply side in hopes that the demand comes later. Now, we could go into this whole idea of in, in this current time in our life, you know, the next month or two, uh, commerce is, is happening more online and that's true, but also you're seeing it inverse also of people apps to, or their willingness to buy, uh, specific, yeah. specifically in different categories. We talked about that last week. Yeah. But I think this is a huge focus on the supply and with hope that the demand will, will soon shift. I think, there's a, I think there's a point though that's missing here. Um, I, I don't disagree with you guys. I think there's an aunt shaking her head already, but I, I I'm shaking my head at your background. Oh, okay. my, back, my Sorry, background is awesome, going. by the way. That's also yeah. an homage to Carter. Um, the point that's missing here, and I gotta get, I'm not going to take credit for this one either, because I, when this story broke, I was talking to my buddy Andy at Facebook, who's like the consigliere for me in general, but I get a lot of good advice from him. And he brought up a really good point that I think is important to bring up in the context of this conversation on this podcast, which is, yeah, okay, you get it. They're trying to get more pu- They're trying to get more merchants on their marketplace. But at the end of the day, that's not what still retail is about, remember? So retail is also about the psychology of how you become a retailer and what are all the services and things you provide to your potential customers. The difference between Amazon and Google is this. Amazon, Google thinks like a retailer. Google is just trying to be a conduit for the retailers to do business. So that is very different when you start thinking about everything that Amazon does on the distribution side, about setting expectations about how you're going to ship, when you're going to ship, what your customer service levels are, if you're going to transact through the platform, if you have problems, who do you go to? Amazon, in theory, helps resolve them. Does Google do that same thing? You know, it's a very contained experience inside of Amazon. So as much as you want to do this, it still makes me feel like in a little ways, and there's a lot of friends from of Google on this show. So it's, you know, I say this, you know, in all sincerity, because you got to be candid here, is that it sounds good, but I don't know if it's going to do anything. Because you've got to fix the other side of that or you've got to come at it from that mental approach to be able to become the retailer and become the place that people want to shop from which people want to shop. And I think that's missing. So you got to, you got to have the volume. You got to have the products on there and Google arguably doesn't have the volume that Amazon does right now to perfect the experience. That's that's fair. I guess that's fair, but I think it's, you know, it's chicken and the egg of what do you do? You can try to do that. And by the way, now you're having to give it at a complete discount. So that also means, you know, how, you know, when you're starting to do that kind of thing, then you wonder where the demand really is in, in, in general. So, but anyway, food for thought, uh, we probably will pick this topic up again in the future um, and segue not intentionally in any way, shape or form to the next story, which also has to do with Facebook Carter. Yeah, as uh, online commerce heats up, Facebook is in the marketplace to make some uh, gigantic investments into overseas companies. Uh, So this week, according to Bloomberg and a whole list of other sources has been really well covered, uh, Facebook has made a $5.7 billion dollar investment into uh, Indian telecommunications company, Geo. So uh, this is the biggest acquisition or not acquisition isn't the right word, the biggest investment Facebook has made uh, since the WhatsApp acquisition in 2014. So Geo is a, a telecom and ISP company specifically in India with hundreds of millions of customers. They have an incredible reach, but that's not what's important about this story. The story is important because they also have a small, uh, which is as, as those watching video in, uh, in, in quotes, uh, e-com startup called Geomart. Now, this small e-com startup is currently offering 50,000 products to be delivered to your home from an express delivery, express delivery standpoint, free delivery with no minimum purchase. Um, and they're serving hundreds of millions of people or they're ramping up to serve hundreds of millions of people in India. Now, Facebook is coming in to this world in an incredibly unique way. And a lot of people are talking about what they're going to be able to do with WhatsApp. So WhatsApp currently combined with geo services combined bring 750 million people uh, together within the country and the thought is is that if they're able to put whatsapp on top of the geomart experience they might be able to actually start driving commerce through whatsapp like they've never been able to do before um, so this is really interesting because what it does is it puts them up against not only amazon but all the other food delivery or, or kind of commerce companies and the idea is they're going to be able to aggregate it all under the whatsapp umbrella in a way uh, that drives actual revenue through the chat platform that currently isn't driving as much uh, money as let's say Instagram or Facebook. So it's a super interesting uh, concept, super interesting to see what's going to happen over the next 12 months. But the idea is they're going to have a single platform for shopping in this incredibly gigantic emerging market. So uh, fascinating to watch. And it'll be really interesting to see how this unfolds over the next few months. Yeah. I mean, Carter, what do you, what do you think, what do you, what's your prediction here on like, you know, cause there's a lot of text conversation angles. We've talked about that a lot on the show. What is your prediction here for how, you know, when it, 
you can see what Facebook's trying to do here, right? They're trying to understand, they're trying to get a foothold on that. They're trying to yep. get a foothold on it in the biggest market. Like at what point do we start to see that over here? Well, I, I think what's key about this is Facebook is coming in to add their user experience layer on top of a commerce engine that's already being developed by a different company, right? Mm -hmm. So what's important to note right now about Geomart hmm. is they don't even have an app yet. The app is still coming later this year. Um, currently, all of the orders have to be go gone or have to be placed through their website. So what Facebook's going to be able to do is come on and layer in WhatsApp on top of this commerce engine that Geomart has been building and provide a user experience that hundreds of millions of customers already know incredibly well. So we talk about, you guys know, I'm a huge fan of text commerce. You're, I'm a huge fan of social commerce because consumers know the platform. I know Instagram. I know Facebook. I, you know, it's taken a while, but I, you know, we all know the Amazon app because Amazon spent hundreds of millions of dollars building an incredible, you know, user facing uh, interface. Now, I think what Facebook's going to be able to do is they're going to be able to add that interface on top of this commerce engine and say, yeah, you can download the app, but why would you do that? Why don't you just use WhatsApp, the app you're using all day, every day. Um, and what they're going to be able to do is they'll take a little bit off the top and start generating revenue from WhatsApp, which has been a little bit more difficult uh, than the revenue generation models that you've seen on Instagram and Facebook. So I think it's a huge play. I think it's really smart. It's a way for them to get into commerce. And it's also a way for them to get into an emerging market in yeah. an incredibly lucrative way. And so uh, to, to, to answer your question coming yeah. back, I, I start to think like, how does it? Yeah, th I think this is a play to say, what can Facebook use in their current library of assets, right? So we all know Facebook assets incredibly well. We know how to navigate, you know, the Facebook app. We know how to navigate Instagram. So we do it for hours and hours a day. How can they use that familiarity? How can they use that trust? How can they use that, um, you know, intuition that we've built up as users to generate commerce? And I think you're going to start to see those interfaces start to be built on top of commerce engines rather than companies trying to build their own app and teach a bunch of users how to do it. Um, so I, I think that's what we're going to start to see. We'll start to see learnings from this rollout um, yeah. overseas start to come here, whether that's in WhatsApp or whether that's just baked into Instagram and Facebook um, themselves. Yeah. And it a little bit goes, and that's why I, I think it goes back a little to what we said with the story on, on um, Google too, is that you, so you mean like you've got this happening in terms of what the story is in and of itself over in India in terms of how they're thinking about things. Then you've got what you know is going on over here, which is Facebook fortifying their marketplace, fortifying Instagram and shopping, but doing it in a way that is quite different than what we just described with Google, where it is almost taking the position of how are we as the retailer? How do we coordinate these activities more like almost eBay style? you know, especially in terms of what they're doing with Facebook to make you feel comfortable and confident that you're, you're entering into a good purchase. And we are just the retailing platform that does that. And to your point, it's going to be interesting to see like how the different platforms for commerce as they emerge, whether it's text or something else plays into what they're trying to do. So this story, while it's overseas and may not seem as important in COVID right now, this is probably one of the most important stories of recent memory, because you're actually talking about something here that five to 10 years down the road, could have a really big impact on how we all shop. Right. And what's important is as a platform, remember what you're good at. What's Facebook good at? Building incredible user interfaces that are addicting and building algorithms that deliver exactly what we want when we want it. Right. And they've combined those things with the immense amount of data they have on every single user. They're not necessarily good at this point at fulfilling orders or at creating product or whatever that might be. So leave that to a company that can do it and has built and made investments into that across the board mm -hmm. and leverage what you're good at. And I think that's what you're going to continue to see to your point here in the United States of um, what they're doing with Instagram shopping, what they're doing with Facebook marketplace or whatever you want to choose. Like I, I, you know, it'll be, it'll be fascinating to see how that continues to expand and how we might rely on these platforms for more than just seeing photos of our friends and family, but also potentially getting served items that we never knew we, we, we needed as we've talked about yeah. before with Instagram shopping, but also maybe using WhatsApp as an incredible text-based uh, ordering system for our groceries. And I think mm -hmm. it'll be interesting to see how they start to leverage WhatsApp as, as a platform here in the United States mm -hmm. to do that, just that. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, let's close it up here. This last story, this, we saved it just for Anne because she's the best at the stories that are just a little bit different. hy V has announced that they are partnering with DSW to have new shop and shops inside hy V stores. Um, they are launching this at a time when they're going to have to start online <laughs> because of the coronavirus outbreak. So they're going to start with a DSW experience on hy 
And then we'll move later into this year with putting these uh, DSW shop and shops into more than 120 Hy-Vee stores uh, company wide. So I love this story. I think uh, for me, there, if there's something that kids need and families need on a regular basis, it's food and shoes. And in a lot of those scenarios, um, the shoes, especially when it comes to kids, these things are last minute. DSW is a household name when it comes to this um, for dependable uh, brand names, especially um, in the sneaker and shoe category. So I think this is amazing. It will help position hy V as they start to go after the Target and Walmart's uh, share when you start to think about how many things you can accomplish in one place. Uh, being able to go to a hy V who already has a lot of offerings in their stores uh, and now being able to have the shopping experience, uh, especially once uh, the DSW uh, shoe pickup, uh, you can buy online pickup inside the, the Hy-Vee stores. I think this is huge. It's going to really help define, I think, what future grocery stores, big box stores, department stores, like what that definition is. Um, so I'm, I'm giving so you like this. You like credit. this. Yes. So you're, you're like this. Emma. I Emma, the intern, Generation Z, are you buying your shoes at Hy-Vee? Uh, no, no. No, whoa, <laughs> mic drop, why not? I, I really like the separation of like food and apparel. I don't want to buy them in the same place. However, I think this is brilliant, like Anne said, mm -hmm. for families where okay. you want to just kind of get everything in one go. So if you have kids. But I mean, I haven't bought shoes in person in so long that I don't even remember. And... I just don't want to get them at somewhere that I get my food. But what if you could pick them up? What if you just pick them up while you were at the grocery store? So you bought them online, but you get to pick them up while you have to go pick up your weekly groceries. With your sliced chub of deli meat. Would you do that, Emma? Sliced think, chubs aside. Yes. I think like, I don't know. I like to buy my shoes from the exact brand that they come from, which kind of like makes me like a snob in that way. Okay. So I just, don't want to pick them up either. I want to order them directly from their website and have them arrive at my door. Okay. Well, Carter, you're Mr. Like order pickup now, you know, like, you know, yeah. back, backwards hat, millennial order pickup. Like, are you do? are you buying, are you getting shoes for the misses at, uh, at high V? What do you think? I think it's easy to trash when it comes from, you know, Oh, are they stylish or, or what's the assortment yeah. or whatever? But I think, you know, over the last six months, we've talked so much about Hy-Vee has become this one-stop shop for families, right? Yeah. It is the yeah. restaurant, the liquor store, all of the food, the take and bake, the et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And I think, yes, it does seem kind of odd that shoes are the next thing. Yeah. But, and to your point, it's like, you know, what do families need? It's it's shoes and groceries. And I, and I think, yeah, it's it's funny and all, but I, there's some truth behind yeah. that. And I think the more that Hy-Vee is able to put into their footprint, the more value that that stops going to, to, to provide. And the more people are going to want to go to that location for that one stop. And I think no, no time is this more pr like real than now where people are trying, if you're going to go out, you're trying to minimize uh, how many stops you're making. You're not just aimlessly driving around, making multiple stops at DSW, maybe going to the mall and then stop by the grocery store and then get some takeout on the way home. Yeah. You're wanting to go make one stop, get back in your car and go home. And the more and more high V creates a value within that footprint, within that one stop, the more successful they're going to be. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you, you would, I think the one that told me this too. So what else, you know, who else hy, hy is like the biggest franchise owner of Wahlburgers, right? Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. All the right. nation's largest franchisee. Yeah. They're the largest franchisee. And so, you know, so they have a Wahlburgers now and a DSW, you know, who else has that? The mall of freaking America. So to Carter's point, I think what you're seeing here, and I think what you've seen in this, tr I think you've seen this trend for some time now is you've seen it with Best Buy, say with their shop and shops, the mall is just getting smaller, right? At the end of the day, we're time starved, we're busy. And so if we're going to make that kind of trip, Hy-Vee, Walmart, Target, Best Buy, probably not so much, quite honestly, but th those types of places, those one-stop shops, we're just condensing the size of the mall to make it as efficient as possible. And so, you know, kudos to Hy-Vee for continuing to push the boundaries on this, but kudos to DSW too, because DSW is going to need the points of distribution. If those malls start to close, they're going to need these types of things. And so, you know, high V, yeah, you got Wahlburgers, you got DSW, I can pick up my meat. You know, there's a lot of cool stuff that those guys continue to do. They're definitely, we've said it about HEB too, but these guys are definitely one of the best retailers. 
but it just shows you the trend. I mean, if I had to make a prediction right now, I think there's probably going to be a regional grocer or a grocery first concept more so than Walmart or Target that starts to emerge that kind of takes up the vac space vacated by the malls here over the next 10 or 15 years. All right, we're running a little long. So I want to close it up this week. Thanks so much for sticking with us. If you're live, we'll take your questions at the end of the show. So be sure to get those ready. And we've got a nice thing. So we've got a few fun comments already from folks like folks on our chat line. So thanks for that, making me laugh as I read those. Um, but hey, housekeeping notes, uh, great post on Forbes yesterday, already at 10,000 views. It's on what malls need to do before they reopen. I think there's five important considerations that they should keep in mind before they just rush to reopen uh, and try to do a lot of activity without accomplishing anything for the long term. So you can check that out. We'll email that out again today. We have an awesome webinar next week, too, with Ali Ahmed of Robomart. You might think autonomous grocery and autonomous grocery delivery are a little far out, but in reality, they're really not. It's something that every municipality, every locality can start experimenting with today. Maybe not in terms of the ultimate end state vision of how you and I would expect it, but there are things people can start to do right now this very second. So you're going to want to tune in for that. It's at 1030 Central Time on Tuesday. We'll send the registration out in our email as well. So from Ann, from Carter, from Emma the intern in the great garden state of New Jersey, as always, be careful out there.